Good morning and welcome to Mornings with Mary. It is Thursday and today we are going to talk about the love of learning with learning disabilities. It is possible. So if you are new, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. And as always, hit hashtag replay if you're watching it on the replay. So today is something I'm really, really excited about. I want to get into it in just a second. Let me take my filter off here. So is it possible to have a learning disability and still love learning? Newsflash it is. So in my room and in my in my life we have two children that have been homeschooled and we have a total of four children between us one has been to an LD school and then integrated into public school and she did great one has LD and went to public school did really bad went to military school did really great first one is graduating college in just a couple weeks the second one is going into his junior year of college the third one which is mine which is Liz you've seen her on here before she also has learning disabilities she was pulled out and did great at home and then there's Sarah who has many disabilities and she's been if you take all of their disabilities and put them in one person that's the boo bear and she has a love of learning. Now, the first three, no love of learning. So school actually destroyed their love of learning because how they teach in school is not generally how a child with learning disabilities needs to learn. So therefore, if you ask a fish to climb a tree, it's gonna fail. But if you ask, ask a fish to swim, it's gonna do great. All right, so here's the key. This is the one single key. I'm gonna let it go real early here. You have to know how they learn. So in order to keep their love of learning alive, you have to let that curiosity still be there. Now for Elizabeth, it took us three years to get that love of learning back. Three years, that's a really long time. And we had to battle, and she still battles against feeling stupid, feeling not good enough, feeling like she can't handle this. So for Elizabeth, her learning disabilities, good morning, hey Becky. So Elizabeth's learning disabilities are borderline IQ. She has retention retrieval issues. She has very slow processing speed. Um, and so in school, of course, you know, you have to be able to retrieve things quickly, process them quickly, and be able to know what to pull out and what not to pull out. So her entire school experience was spent full of anxiety because she couldn't access the information. I myself have retention retrieval. And so I like to describe it as we'll be sharing. Oh, awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing this on the special education forums. So for me, the best way I can describe retention retrieval with ADHD, that's me, is this. I want you to imagine a room of filing cabinets, okay? They're all, you have all these separate little filing cabinets. They're all alphabetized. There are drawers that pull out. There are drawers that go in. They lock. It's great. Okay, you got that, right? And then there's a light above, and you can see everything when you go through the files. You can retrieve it and take it out. That's how a normal brain works, okay? Our brains with retention, retrieval, ADHD, and sometimes some slow processing, now go into that same room with all those files called the brain room and dump them all upside down. And then it's even better. So all the papers are scattered all over these little bits of information here and there. And that light, that was above that lit everything so you could find it, it's now out. And it's a disco ball instead. And now you have to try to find words and you have to try to find that answer for the history test and you have to try to find the answer to your friend and you have to try to find the answer to your emotions. You have to try to find the answer to the question that your parent gave you. Where the hell is it? Like you have no idea. Welcome to my brain. Welcome to maybe your child's brain. It's kind of crazy in here, trying to find that information. They don't even know how I learned how to speak or read. Go figure, and I do both really well. And I write. Who would have figured that one, right? So, here's the thing. In order to keep your child's love of learning alive, you have to know how they learn. So for Elizabeth, it was all hands-on. Most children with special needs have a hands-on need to learn because it's another way of getting the information into their brain, all right? So for me, in order to do anything, to memorize it, you're gonna laugh at me. I have to type it, but in the air before I go to sleep, all right? Elizabeth has to see it, she has to draw it. Now Sarah, Sarah has the most disabilities in our family. She has dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and all severe, not mild forms, we're talking severe forms, okay? Um, retention retrieval, 
She, they say she has a borderline IQ, but when you speak to her, you know it's not the case. So chances are it was just the measuring tool that they use. Remember, when they're testing for IQ and they're doing neuroeducational testing, they're testing on paper. Yeah, okay. So if your child has anxiety, if they have trouble reading, if they have trouble writing, they're giving them a test that all of those things are what they're testing them on. So it says her IQ is like 75. You talk to this child and you look at that test and you're like, there's no freaking way. She makes connections to things that other people don't make and she can speak to you as an adult with SAT vocabulary. You can't tell me that kid's stupid. The test wasn't testing how she, how she shines, all right? So not only does she have all that, she has six different vision disorders. So of course she can't take the freaking test. She can't see it. She can't see it. All right, so this one that was really cool. She has a massive passion for learning. She wants to dive deep. This is a kid who really can't read. She's 11 and she can read at a second grade level and write at a first grade level and yet she wants to write a book. Her goal is to own as many books or more than Mr. Vanderbilt in the Biltmore and he has over 8,000 books and she wants to be able to read them all. I have one who bombs every computerized multiple choice test. Yeah, me, yeah, me too. I'm like, give me an essay. I'll blow your socks off, but give me multiple choice. I can't find those files. They're in there. So it's crazy. So in order to make sure that they still love learning, you have to take off everything you have been taught about learning. You have to de-school yourself, not your kid, yourself. And you have to realize that learning happens outside of a worksheet, outside of a workbook, outside of a textbook. Because these may not be the paths to what gets them to click. There are so many resources in today's world. It is so much different than when you and I were growing up. Let's talk about Khan Academy. Let's talk about YouTube. Let's talk about all these resources that we have for our children that because we have been trained to think education happens with a teacher in front of the room that gives a lecture, that hands a worksheet out, that is called non, um, I wanna call it non-inclusive learning or the Jeffersonian method. It means that it's just lecture and it is proven to be the worst way of teaching. But what do we do in school? That, and then what do parents think? Well, that's what I have to do. No, no, it doesn't work. Children are full of passion and questions and interest. Listen to them. Find out their passion. Find out their interest. And then find out how they learn. So we teach Sarah like she's blind. She's not blind. She can see. She can't process. She has 1% visual comprehension. So we don't teach her that way. So. When we test her auditarily, because in North Carolina, you have to give standardized tests every year, she should be in fifth grade. She tests out at almost seventh grade for comprehension, for reading, and for math. Almost seventh grade. We do zero curriculum. You might say, that's crazy. It works for us, okay? Because I understand that learning happens in more than one way. And the truth about learning is it, education is about being able to apply what you've learned. It's not about being able to check off a box. So how does your child learn best? Do they learn best role playing? Do they learn best being able to read, being able to hear, being able to hands on? Or do you have to combine all of it? Good morning, Carolyn. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I'm a multifaceted sort of person and I need hands on auditory even though I have auditory processing disorder I hear the like weirdest things all the time if I ever look at you like this it's kind of like just make sure you ask me Mary what did you hear because chances are what I heard is freaking hysterical and it takes a second for it to go from the ear to my brain to decoding it to being able to process it all right sorry got an itchy hair there so observe your child figure out what the key to them is. They're going to show you. Don't listen to their words, okay? We speak what we want. We say and like, you know, we, we say what we want, we, we talk what we want, but we do what we need. So if your child is showing you they need hands-on things, that they need to be out in nature, that they need to interact on the computer via video games because maybe the rest of the world is way too much for them, 
take that hint. So Becky says, I have one who is visual and hands-on manipulation. The other is auditory with text. Exactly. And it's really okay if you have multiple children and they have multiple different ways of learning because we are all different. And that is the beauty of being able to use self-led learning. All right, because they take it. So here's an example. So Sarah loves to sew and she wanted to learn about princesses and she wanted to learn about the Renaissance. So of course we went to the Renaissance fair, but she made her own dress. And by doing that, not only did she learn home ec stuff and learning how to sew, she learned how to measure, she learned fractions, she learned decimals, she learned inches versus centimeters, she was able to learn about the history of the dresses, who wore what, how they dyed the, how they would dye the, the fabric. We also learned that they would, well, they'd urinate on the dresses and then they'd hang them out over the moat. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I don't even want to think about that, smell that. But we learned in-depth stuff about the history and that made her really curious about well then what was the music of the renaissance and so then we went through and we learned music and she learned how to play the i don't know wasn't the flute the the lute the lyre whatever it was and we made one and it sucked but it was all hands-on and she really got into it and then we we went so far as to do shakespeare midsummer night dream uh-huh she was 10 and we were acting out the different parts and pretending we were fairies and Learning becomes fun when you get involved, not when you are the bystander giving instructions of things to do. A manager does that, a manager dictates, a leader does. So do with your child, that's what they want. People say, oh, tweens and teens, they're so disconnected, they hate you, blah, blah, blah. No, they don't, they need you to connect with them where they are. Be with them, listen to them. Let them learn how they learn because that's how you're going to get it. And then they're going to have this huge passion for learning. And isn't life really about learning? I'm constantly reading new books, All right, To be the top CEO of a company, they say you have to read a minimum of 60 books a year. I mean, that's more than one a week. So you want this passion to grow. It doesn't matter the topic. Stop thinking that you have to have history and, and English and math and da da da. No, see, life is all about being inclusive and learning is inclusive. You can take one topic and you can pull every single subject into that topic and they're going to be excited. And when they're done being excited, that means they've absorbed as much as they can. Each of us are a sponge and the sponge is a different size with different things. And you have to understand when they stop digging, they have absorbed all they can for that moment and they need to process what it is. Back off, let it be. You didn't push your kid to keep walking, did you? Like, oh, look, you walked yesterday. Now we're gonna walk like a quarter mile today. No, you let them walk, you let them fall, you let them toddle, you let them, you know, cruise on the furniture. Learning is the same exact thing. Stop thinking that it has to be sequential. It's not. It is forwards, it is backwards, it is circular, and sometimes it takes years for them to get where they want to be. And it's really okay. Because once you start putting these parameters down about what they have to do and they have to fit in this box and they have to be here at a certain time, you're going to kill all the love of learning. Let them ask questions, teach them, guide them on how to answer those questions so that they become independent learners. Even if they have visual disabilities, etc., we sit down together. Hey, Sarah, what do you want to, what do you want to learn about? What are you interested in? And she sits next to me as I do it. And sometimes she tells me what to do because it, she can't see the keyboard all right so I do it for her but she's learning the process of learning to go through what questions do I ask how do I get there how are they connected when am I saturated and when do I need to dig deep so I hope this makes sense to you because really learning disabilities are not a disability they are just a new discovery they are a learning discovery about where they can go believe in them listen to them, watch them, and don't take the I don't know as the holy grail. And don't take it as it's against you or against them. It's easy to do, I know. I'm like, damn girl, that, like, that isn't an answer. Think, dig a little deeper, be a little gentle. And really, it doesn't matter when they get there on their timeline, it's the right time. Their time is the right time. Take off the guidelines because they have their own, all right? So, number one, let them ask questions. Number two, 
Watch them. Observe them. Don't listen to their words. Watch what they do. They're going to tell you how they learn. And number three, take off those guidelines. When they're ready, they'll get there. Support them. Listen to them. Engage with them. Make mistakes with them. Get dirty with them. And you're going to have someone who is a lifetime learner. Forget about the disabilities. Don't even put that word. Like, dis the word. All right, dis, they have an ability. It's just different than everyone else's. We don't fault the fish for swimming, and we don't fault the monkey for climbing. Different things, different opportunities. All right? So tomorrow's Friday. We're going to catch up on the week. We are going to have an Ask Me All You Want, and I'll give you the update on Mommy Talk Live, because I've got a new channel coming. We're going to do this every day on Facebook Watch starting June 1st. I have my own channel. I'm keeping it called Mornings with Mary. It's going to be live. It's going to be just like this, but over there. Who knows? Maybe I'll get syndicated. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right, so new updates. Go to the website. It's Mary Harrington with an E like a ton of herring fish. Check out the new stuff. I'm writing blogs this weekend. So catch up on some of the old ones. Check out the new programs. Check out the membership because starting on May 15th, I'm going to be giving away a free 30-day trial. Yeah, that's it. So you're going to have to check it out. See if it's what you are even interested in looking at. And make sure that you sign up for that five days of a basically a more harmonious home because we're going to go from there. All right. It is Thursday. It has been Mornings with Mary. I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.